In his essay on the inconsistency of our actions, Montaigne writes that we are all patchwork, and so shapeless and diverse, in composition that each bit, each moment plays its own game. And there is as much difference between us and ourselves as between us and others. In this podcast series, indeed a patchwork in its own right, I've tried to make a gesture more than present a case. When the cases have been too deep, I've stuck to the bank. In some cases, the road was so well beaten that I could not but walk in others' footsteps. Of the thousand paths I could have taken, the podcast declared that the ones presented here were the best. I varied when I please and gave myself up to doubt and uncertainty and my ruling quality, which is ignorance. Every moment, you see, reveals us. The visible hands are so much with us. What would a future look like in which the hands were not so visible? In which the hands doing the moving were not managements at all, but our own? Those two versions of reality, of course, were with us from the beginning. Consider the Courier and Ives print of 1868 across the continent westward the course of empire takes. Depending on your point of view, here is depicted the march of civilization. Forests are being cleared for the towns that are emerging across the landscape of the railroad. Present are reticent Indians, celebratory townsfolk, and a one-point perspective that stretches to infinity. Or depending on your point of view, here is a 19th century rendering of Philip Roth's human stain. The less dichotomous view of these adventures of a city upon a hill was rendered between 1847, when Henry David Thoreau left the cabin at Walden Pond after a stay of just over two years, and 1854, the date of the publication of Walden. Robert Saddlemeyer has identified seven identifiable drafts of the manuscript written during that period. What was Thoreau up to? He was creating and recreating nature when away from it, fashioning a message to the empire that indeed this colony was able to maintain a sense of self-reliance. Years away from the experience of the woods, he recreated that experience in his drafts so that it would be preserved within the text itself. Because his message was important, he wanted to get it just right. In many ways, that desire to get it just right is important to us as well. Not because it's required, or not because it's demanded, but that it's been part of the student work I've tried to show you throughout this series. Jenny McCormick has created Visual Coastal New Jersey because she wanted to create a tour of the New Jersey coast using her words and photographic images to re recreate the coast for those who might never see it. Her message was that Sandy Hook was important and needed out of its immediate context to be preserved. Indeed, if done well, even a deadly course such as corporate communication be can be transformed from a lemon-squeezing curriculum of comma use and audience manipulation into a community in which many voices examine what is truly needed to communicate in a computer-mediated world. In this course, the one I'm showing you here, students created their own podcasts on topics of relevance to graduate students interested in the study of corporate communication. Let's listen a bit to one of those podcasts. Welcome to the Corporate Communication Podcast Series on Corporate Social Responsibility. My name is Paula Sohm, and the title of this podcast is The Importance of Integrated Corporate Social Responsibility Policy. In today's global competitive market economy, it's critical that companies integrate a corporate social responsibility strategy throughout their organizations. In March 2007, Fortune magazine editors ranked General Electric at the top of their America's Most Admired Companies list. GE's Ecomagination campaign brilliantly combines investor-friendly increased revenues with a doubled research and development budget. With this strategy, GE has become a 21st century leading industry innovator. Here we see students truly examining and exploring what it means to communicate in a mediated environment. Earlier in this series, I noted the work of Kenneth Burke as holding the potential 
to interrupt the prevailing atmosphere of triumphalism that threatens to lead the Academy, and much along with it, into a dead end of self-assurance. I want to conclude this series with a, a Burkean analysis using his pentad. As a heuristic device, the pentad allows us to ask questions that we would ask in any dramati dramatic situation in which the action mattered. Beginning with act, we can realize that writing in a media environment should be viewed as an act of celebration, as a means of bringing joy to the student and to others evaluating that student's work. In the scene of our interaction in this mediated environment, what was first and best anticipated by Alan Purvis stands today in his Web of Text, Web of God, an essay on the third information transformation. There, Purvis established the powerful role that technology would play in our communicative lives and the potential for community that rested within that mediated environment. The agents in this series, my colleagues at New Jersey Institute of Technology, are presently working toward a process of technology transfer of the community we have created here under the leadership of Nancy Coppola, innovators in the technology adoption process such as Texas Tech University, are working with us to develop assessment processes that work to serve students well in the asynchronous communities we're all creating across the nation. This process of transfer is presently being continued under the sponsorship of the Council for Programs in Technical and Scientific Communication with colleagues in the Research Network Forum sponsored by the Conference on College Composition and Communication. We will continue this process. The strategies or agency of communicating in a computer-mediated environment are, in essence, the characteristics of postmodernism. It is not so much that the modern world is disappearing as much as it is that the tenants no longer hold. With the kinds of exposition provided by Andreas Hussein and After the Great Divide, dated of David Harvey, in the condition of postmodernity, and less to fagly and fragments of rationality, we will be able to better navigate the world of contingency that is upon us and learn to recognize the potential for growth that rests therein. And what of the purpose of writing in a mediated environment? If we rid ourselves from the narrow view of utilitarianism and rethink the concepts of community and service with Glenn Tinder and Robert Coles as our guide, we may be able to find deeper, more relevant, more meaningful aspects of our work. In my southern community, it is always good manners to thank your hosts, and it would be remiss unless I name the members of my immediate community, the NGIT, with whom I work every day to try to get things right in this mediated world. In university web services, Ken Rockowitz, Blake Haggerty, instructional technology and media service, Kip Rowan, Bill Dooley, Bill Reynolds, Joe Bonchi, Victor Passaro, and Maria Conte, and Gedalia Woolash in university computing systems, and Dave Ullman, associate provost for information services and technology, and Gail Spock, associate vice president for computing and district education, and Joel Bloom, vice president for academic and student services, and provost Priscilla Nelson and President Robin Aldenkirk, and Dean of the College of Science and Liberal Arts, Fadi Deek, and of course, always and everywhere in my own department, Bob Lynch, Robert Friedman, Nancy Coppola, Carol Johnson, Chris Funkhauser, and Burke Kimmelman. Together, they have shepherded the growth of the new media here at NJIT. Writing in a mediated environment thus does not cause the end of the essay. It does, however, like the appearance of Thoreau's Walden print, signal that an event has and is occurring. The age of authority should now pass. The colony is doing quite well. The essay, as presently understood, is very limiting, very constrained form of discourse, a remnant of modernism, a relic of, of command and control thinking that has led already to far, far too many dead ends. Writing in a mediated environment allows a new vision for us and for our students. It is a vision that is worth the time it will take to bring it to realization. The allegory is upon us. Of course, as Joni Mitchell reminds, it'll all be up to you, constant stranger. Whatever will be accomplished, it all comes down to you.
taught by lovers and styles of clothes Things that you held high and told yourself were true Lost or changing as the days come down to you Down to you Constant stranger, you're a kind person You're a cold person too It's down to you 